we're so glad that you are with us today. And I want to read just one scripture before, before I have you take your seat. It's Romans 12, 2. And it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you can go ahead and have a seat. And I want to tell you the title of this message. It's the things we tell ourselves. The things we tell ourselves. How many of you have watched the show The Voice? It, it's, a, it's a good show. It's a, it's a competition where vocalists are competing to be on the team of some famous artist. And the unique thing about the show is that the judges can only choose the contestants based on their voice. They don't get a bio, they don't get to see what they physically look like, they can only go by the sound. And when they wanna choose a contestant, they hit the big red button and their chair flips around. And sometimes it's kind of obvious, like the person looks exactly like what they were expecting in their mind. And other times it's like, really? That sound came out of you? And there's just this contrast of, I never would have guessed that you could sing like that. And it makes me think about how we have a voice, a voice that we communicate to one another with, and we use it all the time, but we have another voice, and it's the voice in our head. It's the voice of the things that we tell ourselves. And those two voices can be very different. And I wonder if I had maybe connected with you on the phone and had never met you before and said, hey, I'll be at church today. Meet me at the front doors and you can sit with me. But I didn't have a physical description of you. I didn't know what you were going to be wearing or what you would look like. If I could only look for you based on the voice in your head that you the things that you say about yourself. Would I recognize you? Would I be able to recognize you by the things that you say to yourself? The things you said to yourself when you got up this morning? The things that you said to yourself as you got ready? The things you said to yourself as you were getting ready to walk into the auditorium? Was it if, if I heard that voice, would I think, this is an amazing person, the son or daughter of the king? Or would I think, this is a misfit? Would I think, this is someone with something to contribute? Or would I think, this person's a burden? If I was listening to the things you say about yourself, who would I be looking for? It's a good question. You might be shocked to know that when my son was in kindergarten and I would go to be the parent helper, the voice in my head said to me, all the adults here think you're a freak. And you might be surprised to know that when my husband was first attending the Mountain View campus after his first marriage failed, that the things he was telling himself was, when they find out your marriage failed, they're gonna think you're a cheater they're gonna think you're an adulterer. And it doesn't maybe look like what we looked out like on the outside, but that's what our voice can do. That's how different the things we tell ourselves can be. Would you talk to others the way that you talk to yourself? Would you critique others the way you critique yourself or accuse others the way you accuse yourself, require of others, demand of others? Or is it possible that sometimes you are your own worst enemy? I've been my own worst enemy. I've been the voice in my head that doubted me, questioned me, guilted me, shamed me, judged me, and disqualified me. I've been that voice. And I'm drawing your attention to this because 
the most important voice in your life is not your parents' voice if you're a young person or your spouse's voice if you're married or your pastor's voice or even God's voice. The most important voice in your life is yours. The most important voice in your life is yours. And the things that you're telling yourself could be the reason life doesn't look the way you want it to. The things you're telling yourself could be the reason you're stuck somewhere. It could be the reason you feel frustrated or the reason you're experiencing pain. If you're not your own best cheerleader, if your voice is not a vibrant fountain of life that is propelling you forward and cheering you on as a son or daughter of God, then it's time to detoxify your relationship with yourself. It's time to clear out the drudge or the sludge. It's time to clean it up. You need to love you. You might wonder why it matters. In John 8, 25 and 26, the people ask Jesus, just who are you anyway? And he replies, what I've said from the start. I have so many things to say that concern you, judgments to make that affect you. But if you don't accept the trustworthiness of the one who commanded my words and acts, none of it matters. If you don't trust the one who wrote the word and did the things, none of it matters. That is who you're questioning, not me, but the one who sent me. We override God's plan for us. We override his word by the things that we tell ourselves. We override them. In Revelation 12, verse 11, it says, They overcame him, the evil one, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Faith isn't a fantasy. It's not a magic act. Faith is taking possession of what's been made available to us. And so our victory comes through what Jesus did for us. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. But then why does it add on and the word of their testimony? Because if they don't accept what was done, if they declare defeat in the face of this victory, how can they stand in a place of authority? Is the voice in your head a voice of victory or is it a voice of defeat? He gave us the right to have the last word. Victory, but what am I going to tell myself about it? What are you telling yourself about it? Some of the things that we tell ourselves are powerful family histories that we recite over and over, and we can exalt them above God's word, and we can say, well, my dad was like this, and his dad was like that, and so I'm like this, and my son's like that, and we can say, my grandma had breast cancer, and my mom had breast cancer, and I had breast cancer, and so now my daughter's getting tested for breast cancer. And we've never had money. My grandparents went through the 30s, and they didn't have anything, and my parents didn't have anything, and we're just people that don't have anything. Or we tell sp histories of addiction, or histories of sickness, or we just tell them. We exalt them above God's word. And guess what that testimony does? Mark 7, 13 says, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down. We can make God's word of no effect by the things that we tell ourselves. And then we pass it on. We can pass it on. We don't just override God's word with the stories that we tell ourselves, but we actually influence how other people see us and treat us. In Numbers 13, the spies have gone into the promised land. 
and they've seen the goods. They've actually seen evidence of the promise. They've seen the land flowing with milk and honey. They drank it, they ate it, they tasted it, they brought the grapes back. But they still had what they told themselves above that. And this is what they said. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. That's what they told themselves. But then there's one more piece. And so we were in their sight. That's how we looked to them. That's how they saw us. And we, when we tell ourselves things about ourselves that aren't, that don't line up with the word of God, we also project it to other people to see us that way and to treat us that way. We project it to other people. If you think about a stronghold of rejection, and I came out of a family with strong lineage of rejection, you project it, you expect it, you tell people by the way you interact with them that they should reject you. And you wonder why it keeps happening. It matters so much what we're saying to ourselves. And we have the opportunity to make a different statement when we recognize, maybe I've been saying some things I shouldn't. And instead of saying, I was a grasshopper, we can stop it and we can say, grasshopper? I don't think so. Rejected? I don't think so. Unwanted? I don't think so. Terminal? I don't think so. Limited? I don't think so. Hopeless? I don't think so. What a powerful statement that we can make with the changing of our mind. Like it or not, we're living the results of what we think. And that might sound kind of extreme, but think about salvation. In Matthew 3, verse 2, it says, in the Amplified Version, repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Not like feel really bad about it. Repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins, live your life in a way that proves repentance, which is changing your inner self, your old way of thinking. Salvation comes through a change of thinking. And it's not one time. It's, it's just like I read, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every time you encounter limitation, ask the Holy Spirit to show you anywhere where the things you're telling yourself are exalting themselves above God's word, where they don't line up. I know that sometimes we can respond to statements of responsibility, which is what I'm giving you, with this attitude of, but you don't know what I've been through. And, And I don't. I don't. We've all been dealt a hand. And that's just life. But I've got a hand of pain of my own that I've been dealt with. And so I have some understanding. And so I was conceived illegitimately, which meant from a young age, I knew I was unwanted. And then at age six, I went to a Catholic school and I was a Protestant kid. And I heard this thing called the gospel and found out I was a dirty, rotten sinner. But I was a Protestant, which meant there was no way for me to make myself right with God. And I just realized I was bad is bad. And then when I was about 11, I was sexually abused by a pastor. And it didn't feel right. And I eventually told. But the response of telling was that they moved him. They didn't stop him. And so I decided, well, then I must be the one whose fault it was. I must be guilty. 
And I'm not wanting your attention to go to the things that happened. I'm wanting your attention to go to what I told myself. Then in my teens, my dad was in a volatile business relationship and our physical lives were threatened repeatedly. And I'd watch my dad lay on the couch with a migraine headache, covering his eyes, trying to shut out life. And I believed that we were powerless. When bad things happen, there's nothing you can do about them. So I, then I grew up, became an adult, ran my own life, and met, met someone in college, went into an abusive marriage, had a child, the marriage fell apart. I went through a custody battle. I spent two years and over $120,000 in legal fees, and they took my son away from me. And I told myself I was a victim. And so I continued on in life, living out pain, not just because of what had happened, but because of what I told myself it meant. And my first experience of a change of mind happened when I received Jesus. And so it took care of one of the, one of the cards I'd been dealt, this sense of feeling like I was bad and there was nothing that I could do about it. And while it was true that there was nothing I could do to make myself right with God, I discovered that he had done everything necessary for me to be made right with him. He'd done it all. Amazing. Amazing that nothing could ever separate me from the love of God from that point on in my life. And so I took that card out of my hand. It didn't have power over me anymore, feeling like God had rejected me. But I continued on carrying my hand of pain, loving Jesus, learning about Jesus, growing in the knowledge of him, and a few years later, I had my second significant change experience. And I went to a workshop where the facilitator began to read my hand, every card that I had. And she began to talk about the abuse I'd been through and what I felt and how painful it was. And I was all ears. Like, here's someone who knows and understands she's going to tell me how to stop the pain. Because I'd lost my son. Pain was a daily experience for me. It didn't go away with time. And so I listened because I think she's going to start sympathizing and I think she's going to start accusing in, you know, empathizing with me. And instead I hear her say, this way of thinking. And my mind kind of goes on fast forward going, this way of thinking, what's she talking about? How can there be another way of thinking? And if there is another way of thinking, what is it? And then I kind of tuned back into what she said, and she started talking about a victim mentality, a belief that life just happens to you and there's nothing you can do about it. It's like thinking that you just get handed the script every day to see what's going to happen instead of being the author of your story. And I found freedom that day. Not because I got a divorce, not because someone rescued me from bad circumstances. I found freedom because I went rejection, abuse, terror, victimization. I don't think so. I changed. I was not the same person ever again because I had changed my mind. Salvation's vital. We have to have Jesus. But if I hadn't changed my victim thinking, I could be here today sitting in the chairs on my fifth or sixth broken relationship in continued pain probably some full-blown disease in my body, wondering why God never answers my prayers. And still loving Jesus. It's so easy to do with the things we tell ourselves. So I want to just talk quickly about a few of the things that you might tell yourself. The first one is, I'm unwanted. And what I want you to know is, God didn't ask anybody's opinion about whether you were wanted or not. He chose you. He chose you. 
1 Peter 1, 2 says, you were chosen according to the purpose of God the Father and were made a holy people by his spirit. It settled it. And so when that thought comes in your mind, you're unwanted, you've got to give it, and I don't think so. The second thing we tell ourselves is we're bad. You know, I grew up in an era where shame was just how you disciplined. And it was like, well, if you just make somebody feel bad enough about themselves, they'll behave better. And I don't think shame made me behave better at all, but it sure taught me how to feel bad. And I can still remember, I can hear it in my ear, the shrill voice of my grade one teacher from over half a century ago announcing to the class that all were good except one. And that one was me. <laughs> and we, we just have these experiences that we think we can't remedy, we can't do anything about. We're just bad, and all we can do is feel bad. But God's way of dealing with sin is not shame, it's conviction. And conviction reaches and draws close. Because when we get close, we have the empowerment to live a life of righteousness. And condemnation pushes away into isolation. And there's no better place to sin than in isolation. So shame and feeling bad about yourself doesn't accomplish anything except to separate you when God said nothing could separate you from his love. And so the reality is we've all sinned, but if you've given your life to Christ, here's the good news. You died and were born again. And Galatians 2.20 is one of my favorite verses. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And then it says, I don't set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And when we are feeling bad about ourselves, all we're doing is going, thanks, Jesus, that was really nice. Too bad it wasn't enough for me. And you've got to go, shame? I don't think so. The third thing that we tell ourselves is, I'm guilty. And I don't know what mistakes you've made. I certainly have done things that I regret. But we can be like Judas or we can be like Paul. And Judas betrayed Jesus. And instead of repenting, instead of asking forgiveness, he killed himself. Paul, on the other hand, murdered I don't know how many Christians before he became a Christ follower. And so these two people told themselves different things. And when we condemn ourselves for what we've done, what we do is not physically die the way that Judas did, but our calling and our purpose never gets fully lived out. Our body's alive, but who God made us to be isn't. And we limit ourselves. Colossians 2 says, in verse 13 and 14, having forgiven you all trespasses. It doesn't get any bigger than that. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, your record has been cleared. And so if God has no record of your sin or your failure, why would you rehearse it? Why would you keep telling it to yourself? And the next time you feel guilt, I'm, I'm telling you, you've got to give it, and I don't think so. Put an end to that sentence. And the fourth thing is, I'm accused. Sometimes the voice in our head isn't our own. It's the voice of someone in our history who called us something hurtful, who told us we'd never amount to anything, made fun of us, hurt us, diagnosed us, sentenced us. But we repeat verbatim, day after day after day, their words. We tell ourselves what 
our parents said, what a bully said, what a teacher said, what an ex, ex-spouse said, what a doctor said. And those people kind of faded away, moved away, passed away, and their message lives on. And we're the one that's giving it. And we're poisoning our own life. We become our own bully. Don't you know what you've done? You never do this. You always do that. Why don't you do this? Why did you say that? Chances are, some of those voices you heard, you weren't even the problem. You were just an outlet for someone's pain or frustration or fear. But you can take it and live in the pain of it. And the truth is, you don't have to change anyone's mind. And true victory comes when you change your mind. When you change your mind. So accusation, I don't think so. And what do you need to change? What do you need to stop telling yourself? Whose voice do you need to stop echoing? We get to choose what we think and what we tell ourselves. You know, I get to drive my car any way I want. I can drive it in the ditch. I can drive it on the wrong side of the road into oncoming traffic. I can drive it anywhere. But I typically drive between the lines because it gets me where I want to go. And yet our thoughts come and we fail to steer them. And we're in the ditch and we're in oncoming traffic and we're off-roading and we wonder why we're not getting where we want to go. And this is, this is how God, this is, these are God's lines on the road in Philippians 4. And I want you to hear it thinking about the voice in your head. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that and God who makes everything work together will work you into his most excellent harmonies. You can't tell yourself whatever you want and experience a John 10, 10 kind of life, life to the full till it overflows. You get to choose, but you can't choose anything and have the kind of life that this says about you. Because as you think it, as you tell it to yourself, you create it and you experience the pain of it, whether it's true or not. 3 John 1 verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Your soul prospering means the voice in your head has to be a fountain of life. And if it's not, it's affecting your prosperity relationally, financially, spiritually, and it's affecting your physical health. It's time to line our thoughts up to what God's word says about us, what he calls us, and to preach that to ourselves. How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news right in our own mind. And you wake up and you celebrate you and you wake up and you tell yourself the things that God says about you and the things that God has for you. Those are the kind of things you're meant to tell yourself. And so tonight, today, I speak over you the freedom to change your mind. No many, no matter how many generations the stories have been going, I speak the freedom to stop repeating them. No matter what was said about you, what you were sentenced to, what you were diagnosed, I speak the freedom to say, I don't think so. I speak the freedom 
to break off the conformity to the ways of the, this world, that you might be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I break off the labels, I break off the limitations, I break off the restrictions, I break off hopelessness, and I just free your minds to hear and to see what he says about you. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Christ, this is what I want you to know. God became a man in Jesus Christ, and Jesus lived the life that we should have lived without sin. And he died the death that we should have died in punishment for our sin. And three days later, he rose again, proving that he was the Son of God and making the way for our sins to be forgiven and us to have eternal life. If you've never given him your life, if you've never received his forgiveness tonight, I just want to ask you on the count of three if you would raise your hand so that I could pray that prayer with you. One, two, three. If you'd like to pray that prayer, I just invite you to raise your hand. And then as we just continue in this moment of worship, I want to invite you to let the Holy Spirit bring to mind the things that you need to transform. Let him illuminate what you've been thinking that's been holding you back or keeping you captive and let freedom come as we worship. I am chosen, not forsaken. Pastor Melanie, a thank you for that amazing message. So good. So good for all of us. And um, I want to just declare God's blessing over you. So if you just take a moment, just lift up your hands and just receive the blessing today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he favor you. May he lift his countenance towards you. May he give you his peace. We just declare peace over your heart and mine in Christ Jesus today. We give you, Lord Jesus, all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's get